All right, guys, uh, take your Bibles, go back to Luke chapter 8. And as Caleb said, it is a great chapter. As we're reading through it, it's pretty chunky. How many verses? 56 verses. And there's a lot of stories. So I'm going to try my best to get through the whole chapter. Um, If I can't get through it within a reasonable time, I'll I'll, uh, save it for some other sermon. But look at verse number 12, Luke 8, verse 12. It says, those by the wayside, are they that hear? Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Lest they should believe and be saved. The title of the sermon this morning is Believe and Be Saved. Believe and Be Saved. Verse number one, Luke 8 verse 1. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings, of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. Hey, what's another way to explain or express the glad tidings that Jesus is preaching? What's a word that we're very familiar with? When we talk about glad tidings or good tidings, it means it's the gospel. The gospel means glad tidings. I'll just quickly read to you from Romans 10:15. The Bible says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel, pay attention to that word, the gospel of peace, and bring glad tidings of good things. So there we have in Romans 10, 15, the gospel of peace is compared as the glad tidings of good things. Now in Romans 10, 15, it says it is written. Where is it written? You don't need to turn there. It's Isaiah 52, verse 7. Isaiah 52, verse 7, which says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. Hey, what did Romans 10, 15 call it? The gospel of peace. What does Isaiah 52, 7 call it? The good tidings that publisheth peace. Then it says that bringeth good tidings of good and publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Hey, what is the gospel? It is publishing salvation. All right? The gospel is not feeding the poor. The gospel is not looking after the widows. The gospel is not coming to church. The gospel is not get baptized. The gospel is preaching salvation. It's preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice there in verse number one that it says that he went throughout every city and village. Hey, what was the purpose of Jesus Christ? Was it to go to some cities and some villages? No, in his ministry, his purpose was to go to every city of Judah and preach. Okay, now look at the last verse of of Luke chapter 8. Look at the last verse. Because we're going to see this pattern many times in in the Bible, and it might throw you off a little bit. But verse 56, after he heals the little girl, the 12-year-old girl uh, from death, he brings her back to life. It says here, And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. So it seems like, as you read from the Gospels, well, hold on. Many times Jesus says, look, don't tell anyone what's going on. Don't tell them. And then I say, well, hold on, Jesus. Are you trying to hide something? Are you trying to hide the Gospel? Are you you trying to hide yourself from other people that they would not know you or follow after you or believe in you or whatever? No, we see there in verse 1 that his purpose was to go into every city every village, make himself available to everyone. But as you've seen, as we go through the chapters, there were great multitudes following him. All right, if he had everybody of Judea following him, he wouldn't be able to service each person, each village, and each city. Okay, so Jesus had order. He wanted order in the way he would go and and, uh, approach every city. His heart was to reach everybody. Okay, but it was to be done orderly, not out of control with these mass, you know, crowds, even though that still happened. He had literally had thousands of people following after him. So I don't want you to get the idea that Jesus is trying to limit himself. He's not. His purpose is to go into every city and every village. Verse number two. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Now Mary Magdalene gets a lot of attention, you know, uh, from, from certain Christians. And I don't know if you've heard this, but a lot of people believe Mary Magdalene was a, was a prostitute. Let me just say, there's nowhere in the Bible that says that. 
This is the first mention that we have of Mary Magdalene following Jesus Christ. And what do we learn about her? That out of her, Jesus Christ healed her, healed her from the evil spirits. She was uh, possessed by devils. And it says, out of whom went seven devils. So she was possessed by devils. She had seven devils in her. And Jesus Christ had healed her as he had done to many other people and cast out those devils. But now we have a certain group of women following Jesus and his disciples. Look at verse number three, not just Mary Magdalene. Verse number three. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others which ministered unto him of their substance. So you see there are some ladies mentioned with Mary, Joanna, and Susanna, and many others, the Bible says. Okay, so there was a group of ladies that would follow after uh, the ministry of Christ. And what was their job? What were they doing? You know, were they, were they standing up be, before the, gra- the masses and preaching the gospel? No, because the Bible says that women are to remain silent in the churches, right? But hey, were they important to Jesus Christ? They are absolutely important, right? They even mentioned in the Word of God. And what were they doing? They were ministering unto the preachers with their substance. So I assume they were doing the cooking, they were helping maybe so, you know, when, when the clothes were ripped or whatever, they were helping fix up the, the garments. Hey, they were doing what they could to ensure that the men of God, the leaders of the preachers were able to do the job at hand. Okay, so that is the, the role there of a woman. Now, I'm not saying that it's never the role of a woman to go and preach the gospel. It absolutely is. Okay, but it's not the role of the woman to stand before men uh, in masses like in a church and preach, as we see many, many today, you know, Joyce Myers and and other women like that, you know, they're doing things contrary to the word of God. All right. Verse number four. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake a parable. Now this parable that we're about to read is the parable of the sower. It's probably one of the most popular parables that people preach on. I would say this one and the Good Samaritan are probably the two top parables you often hear most popular ones that you hear preached in church. Now, what's interesting about this parable of the sower is that it's, it's interpreted different ways by different preachers, okay? Now, let me just say this. How they interpret this parable will give you a pretty good indication of what they believe about the gospel, okay? If they believe it's by grace through faith on Christ or if they believe it's by works, And you'll have preachers that will still say, yeah, I believe it's by faith. But when you ask them about the gospel, they'll still throw in the works. All right. And and this parable is a good way. If you you know a preacher that preaches on this parable, listen to what they're saying. And that will give you a really good indication. Does this person believe the gospel is by works or does he believe it's by faith alone? All right. So let's have a look at this parable. Verse number five. A soul went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. The wayside's like a footpath. And it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. So, you know, a wayside, a footpath, obviously they didn't have the concrete back then. But even if you were to walk on soil, and and like you'd have masses of people walking on soil, the soil will become compressed, will be hardened. So if you're going to try to plant seed and throw seed on it, it's not going to get into the soil. It's not going to get into the ground. It's just going to sit there on the top. And then as people go by the wayside, they're going to tread on that seed. It's going to be destroyed. Or the birds will be able to come down easily and and eat that for themselves. Okay? Let's Let's go to verse number six. And some fell upon a rock. Now, if you were to take the book of Luke alone, it's a bit confusing. Like, why would some seed fall on a rock? Well, the book of Matthew, when he talks about this parable, it says it fell on stony places. Okay? So it's ground that's rocky but it has some soil. Okay, it's rocky, it's hard, but it still has some soil. And then it says, and as he sowed, sorry, and sorry, as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. So because it's a rocky soil, yes, it can receive the seed, yes, it can spring up, but because it's hard, you know, when it rains, the, the moisture is not going to be able to retain that area very well. And so it withers away with, with a lack of water, with a lack of moisture. Verse number seven. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Verse eight. And other fell on good ground. Now this is, the, this is the interesting one. This is the ground that we want our hearts to be 
when we hear the word of God, either as an unsafe person with a good heart or just as a church member coming to church and being ready to receive the preaching, being ready to receive the teaching from God's word. We want to have hearts that are good and ready to receive. But look at verse 8. The context of this we'll see is preaching the gospel. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit and hundredfold. And when he said these things, he cried, um, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Hey, so he tells this parable and Christ then cries out, you know, he that have ears, let him hear. Now I would say everybody has got ears, right? Do you think it's Jesus' intention that we would know this parable? Absolutely. It's his intention. He says, he that have an ears, let him hear. He wants to explain this parable. This shouldn't be a parable with multiple interpretations. This shouldn't be a parable where you're like, I'm not sure what this is talking about. Jesus wants to reveal this to us. Okay? Verse number nine. And his disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be? Now, this is a really interesting reply from Jesus Christ. And he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Wow. (laughs) You see that? So there are certain people that Jesus says, you're going to understand this parable because yours is the kingdom of God. But for others, they'll see, they hear, but they will not understand. All right? So think about the nature. I don't want to go into the topic of reprobates today, okay? But there are some people that are so hardened that God himself has hardened their hearts to receive his word. They can see, they can see, they can hear, but they cannot understand what is being preached from the word of God. Okay? Obviously, those that can hear and understand are those that are saved. Those that have received Christ as their Savior and they have the Spirit of God in them and they can discern the Scriptures. All right? Verse number 11. Now, Jesus explains this parable to us. Verse number 11. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. The seed is the Word of God. Okay, so now we, we're going to have a parable of, the, of preaching the gospel. Okay, what are we to do when we go and preach the gospel? You know, are we to tell them, hey, you know, we have a good church and we have good activities and we have good people. Is that preaching the gospel? or No, it says we need to go with the word of God. When we sow the seed, we need to take the word of God with us. Okay, I would strongly encourage you to memorize the, the verses of salvation. Memorize the verses about the gospel so you can be an effective uh, sower. Because there are times when people will not allow you to even open this Bible, but they will allow you to speak the words of God. And that's a great opportunity for you to sow seed even without opening the Bible, but you can still speak the word of God. It's essential. I'll just read to you quickly from 1 Peter 1.23. 1 Peter 1.23, talking about believers. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So how are we born again? By the seed, the word of God, not of corruptible seed. Hey, there's a reason why we go with the King James Bible. Okay? Now, if your Bible has an error in it, if your Bible has an incons- inconsistency, it's a corruptible seed. All right? So we need to make sure when we go with the Word of God, we take something that's perfect, that's pure. And I make no apologies to believe the King James Bible is the English, is a perfect translation uh, in English for us that we can use to go and preach the Word of God. I mean, it's, it's a, it amazes me. It's not a question I used to ask, but when I would go with Jason uh, Parkin, when we would meet someone that's already saved... And they'd give us the, they tell us, yeah, it's my faith, we can never lose it, it's eternal life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, not by works. You know, one question that Jason would often ask is, you know, when did you hear this? You know, he would say, oh, in this church, or I was this young, whatever. And, you know, what Bible did you read that from? What Bible? You know what they say? I mean, most often, it surprised me, the King James Bible. It's the King James Bible. And then you go to others that would read from other translations, and you ask them, well, what must you do to be saved? Oh, I've got to live a, be a good person, go to church you know, live a good life. And it's like, well, what Bible are you reading? It's some modern, corrupted translation. 
Okay, so it's, it's interesting. I, I didn't expect to have that response, but I've seen that in the last few months, or even the last year, I should say, uh, of the responses. People that actually know the gospel have heard it from the King James. I'm talking about English speakers here, all right? Let's move on. Verse number 12. Verse number 12. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Now, pay attention to this. The wayside, remember, the footpath, the hard ground where the, where the, where the seed would not be planted into the soil. Are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Hey, how could have these people been saved? By believing the word of God, by believing the gospel. They heard it. Did they believe it? No. Satan sent his messenger, whatever it was, to take that word away and they would not believe it. Okay, this is one group of people that we can preach to. They hear the gospel, do not believe it. Or, you know, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even associate this. When, you, when you're preaching the gospel and someone seems to be really receptive, yeah, you get it, and then somebody in their family yells out, we're not interested. Hey, that's a messenger of Satan. That's someone that's trying to pluck the word out of their heart so they would not believe. It's such a sad thing. All right, let's go, let's move on. So this person does not believe and does not get saved. Does that make sense? Should make sense, right? Is not saved, this person, because they did not believe. Verse 13. Now let's read this slowly. Verse 13. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, they receive the word with joy. Did they receive the seed? Yes, they receive it with joy, actually. And these have no root, which for a while believe. Now, let's stop there for a minute. Do they believe? The Bible says they did. For a while, believe, and in time of temptation, fall away. So what did the previous verse say? To be saved, you have to believe. Does this next group believe? Yeah, they believe. What does that mean? Like, without me trying to give my, my, my thoughts on this, if the previous verse says they believe and are saved, and this person believes... It means they're saved because salvation is by faith and not by works. And yet this represents many Christians today. They believe. They're faithful for a while. They rejoice even. But then the temptations come. The trials, the difficulties of life. Maybe just standing up for Jesus Christ becomes too difficult. Maybe they have families that turn against them because you know, they, they received the gospel. They turned away from their false religion or their false gods or whatever. And they fall away because of temptation. Hey, that can be any of us. That can be any of us. Today, you might be filled with joy. Absolutely. Amen. Praise God. Tomorrow, when you face the trials and difficulties, standing up for Jesus Christ, you might be tempted to just fall away and be quiet. And just, you know what? Uh, you know, I'm saved. Good. But I'm not going to really stand up for the Lord God anymore. Verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they, which when they heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Now, the Bible doesn't say here if they believed or not. But think about just the context, right? These seed fell amongst thorns. They go forth. So there's, there's, a, there's a produce there. I would say these people are saved as well, that they believe because there's been something that's come out of that seed. It's been brought forth. But a choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. No fruit. To, we'll talk about what the fruit represents in a moment. Okay? But these people get saved. Woohoo! Okay? But their eyes are not set on eternity. Their eyes are set on temporal things. Their eyes are set on the temporal riches of this life. You know, the big house, the second car, uh, whatever, whatever it is that, you know, you can enjoy in your other holidays. They'd rather put all these things first than Jesus Christ, than the kingdom of God. And they're choked. The Bible says they're uh, choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. You know, it, sa it sounds like these believers are really enjoying life. But from God's perspective, they're being choked. They're being choked and they're unproductive. They're not bringing any, any fruits to perfection. All right. They're not achieving great things for God. They're achieving great things on this earth. It's only got temporal value. There's nothing eternal uh, for them. Verse 15. Verse 15. 
And this is the best one, right? But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruits with patience. So here we have another group here that, that believe, they receive the word, uh, they, they keep the word and they bring fruit with patience. All right. Now let me just read to you from Proverbs 11 verse 30. Proverbs 11 verse 30. The Bible says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Hey, if you want to be fruitful, if you want to be a tree of life, the Bible says that's the one that wins souls. Okay, what is the fruit? When we read in the Bible, a lot of people think of the fruit of the Spirit. And that's okay, I understand that. Okay, but the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the believer? What is the fruit of the righteous? If you're going to reproduce, what are you reproducing? Other believers. Okay, where, where moms and dads, when they reproduce, they reproduce other children. Okay, other human beings. You know, when churches reproduce, they reproduce other churches. Okay, and so when uh, the spirit reproduces, when you're born of the spirit, it reproduces the new spirit in you. Okay, but when believers reproduce, we're reproducing new believers. Okay. Now, let me just quickly say this. I'll just read to you from Matthew 13, verse 8, because you might remember that it mentioned the hundredfold fruit that was produced. But in Matthew 13, verse 8, it says this, But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Do you think God gives us these numbers for no reason? Some have fruit of thirty, some have fruit of sixty, some have fruit of a hundred. If we tie this together about bringing forth fruits, bringing, preaching the gospel, the word of God, and, and having that fruit, there are some people that will get 30 people saved. There are some that will get 60 people saved. There are some that will get 100 people saved. Hey, but it's the fruit of the season. You know, trees reproduce, you know, in, in its season. So let, let's say it's, it's uh, spring and a tree uh, produces in spring. That means next year in spring, it's going to produce once again. Okay, so it's not limited to these numbers, but limited to the season that tree is fruitful. Think about that for a minute. There are some of us that in our lifetime are going to get 30 people saved, 60 people saved, 100 people saved, and beyond. I mean, these are good targets to aim for. These are numbers that God has given us for a reason. I don't believe it's just a, a nonsense number that Jesus throws at us there. No. So I want you to be thoughtful about this. Are you reproducing? Are you bringing forth fruit? Can you say to me, I've had 30 people saved? And that's the smaller number, not 60 or 100. Hey, if you get to 30 people saved, praise God. That's awesome. That's been productive. That's been fruitful. You know, it's possible to do this. I say, oh, yeah, I got my family saved. That's awesome. It's good that you got your family saved. But you can go beyond that into this community preaching the word of God and having hearts to receive the truth and being saved. These are possible numbers. There was a time in my life when I used to read this and go, this is impossible. 30 people saved in my lifetime? And then I think I got about 30 people saved in one year, once. You know, when I put a lot of effort into soul winning. <clears throat> so, can I get, I'll get my boys, Matthias, Nicholas, Christian, and Sebastian. Can you guys come up here? Just stand in front of the pulpit here, all four of you. Face that way, in front of the pulpit. All right, so we'll start off with Sebastian over here. So let, let's say I'm the sower, right? I go and sow the seed of the Word of God. I come preaching the gospel. I knock on their doors. They're not brothers. They're at separate doors. I knock on their doors, and I come to the one whose heart is like the wayside. It's been compressed. It's been hardened. I come preaching the word of God. He hears it. He understands it, maybe. Okay, but he doesn't receive it. It doesn't take any, any plantation at all in his heart. Then the devil comes along and snatches that word away. And Sebastian, unfortunately, is not saved. 
is not saved. He represents that first one. So you can sit down. All right? Unsaved. We've got three left, though. Three left in the parable. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Whether you believe salvation is by faith alone or whether you believe it's by works. Because the one that believes it's by works, this one that's fruitful, a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold, the one that believes in works when they interpret this parable, they'll say, he's unsaved, he's unsaved, but he's saved. Why? Because look at his works. Look at how much he's done. Look how fruitful he is. But because these guys don't have any fruit, because these people don't have any works, they must be unsaved. Meaning, in their, in their idea, ideology of the gospel, that you must also have the works in order to be saved. Now, if, if we're honest with ourselves, you talk about when you got saved, when you received Christ as your Savior, have you always been this productive, fruitful Christian, always in your life? Or can you say, sometimes in my life, I've been represented by these other guys as well? I think, you know, if we're honest, we've been represented by maybe any of these three guys at different stages in our life, Okay. You might be the one that, uh, what was the next one? Was it the, the, on the rock, yeah, on the, on the stony places. You might be the one that receives it with joy, but there's a lack of moisture. You're not going to church. You're not reading the word of God. You're not having fellowship with the Lord. You're not growing, okay? And then uh, in times of temptation, when he has to stand up for God, because he has so little faith, you know, he perishes, he moves away. But he's still saved. He's saved. He received it with joy because salvation's by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's, that's Nicholas, okay, go sit down. Then we have Christian, you're represented by the, the one who had cares of the life, right? Christian represents the, the believer who's just about the holidays, just about money, how much can I make, how much can I earn, you know, uh, how, how, you know can I climb the corporate ladder and make, make my, a name for myself in the world rather than make a name in the kingdom of God, it's just a name in the world. Yeah, you can be a believer like that. I mean, I, I've been there. I've been saved since I was four years old. And there was a time in my life where I'm just more focused on work, making money, buying a house, doing these kinds of things. And when your heart's set on that, you're just not being productive. You're being choked by the world. And you're going, look, I don't have time to serve the Lord. I don't know how. I, don't, I, don't have to, I just don't have time. Well, it's because your time's spent watching TV and, 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 and feasting on, on the lust of the flesh and all those kinds of things. So, you know, that's Christian. And then we have Matthias who says, hey, you know what? I can't keep these words to myself. I've been saved. I received it. I need to go out there and preach to other people because they're lost and dying and going to hell without the gospel. And so he, he makes it his job. I'm going to go out every week, once a week, 52 weeks a, a year, and preach the gospel. And it said with patience. Is he going to get the first person, the first door someone saved? No. Could be a hundred doors, but patience. Okay, a hundred doors. Eventually, one day, he's going to get to somebody that's ready to receive it, ready to believe, and call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Okay, Matthias, sit down. My point is, it's the first one that did not receive the word and did not believe. Okay, the other three received it, were saved, but they represent believers. As you know, I'm sure you know many believers that you could say, yeah, they easily represent one of these three. Okay. And you might, in your life, you might go through different phases in your life and represent uh, each one of those. All right, let's move on. Um, actually, no, let's not move on yet. Keep your finger there. Keep your finger there in Luke chapter 8 and go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Because I want to give you guys just a bonus, uh, I don't know, what do I call it? Bo bonus material on this. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 10. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Try to remember what we've covered in this parable. And now we look at this, this uh, passage. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. The Bible says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, pay attention to these words, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, you might say, what does that have to do with this parable of the sower? Because a lot of people use this passage, so those that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, they take this passage and they read it this way. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, whatever that means, I will also keep thee from the hour, and then they'll replace hour with seven years of temptation. They'll replace temptation with the great tribulation. 
All right? So they interpret it as whatever the word of patience means uh, will be kept from the seven years of tribulation. Look at this, the pre-trib rapture here in the Bible. Okay, now we don't believe in the pre-trib rapture here. We believe in a post-trib, pre-raph rapture. But now that we have scriptures, we can compare scripture with scripture. I think Revelation 3.10 makes a lot more sense now when we understand this parable of the sower. Let's look at Revelation 3.10 again. Because thou hast kept... Now, what did it say in, in Luke 8.15? But on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, okay, and bring forth fruit with patience. Let's look at Revelation 3.10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. What, is, what are these believers doing? What are they patiently doing? And keeping the word of God in patience, what are they doing? They're sowing the seed. They're, they're being fruitful Christians. They're going out, knocking doors, preaching the gospel. And it's because you're one of these people in, in Revelation 3.10. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation. Think about the parable of the sower. Which is the one that fell into temptation? The one that was on the rocky ground. The one that fell upon the rock. Remember? They received it with joy. Woohoo! But then came temptation and they fell away. All right? So you say, I don't want to be that Christian. What do I do? Revelation 3.10 gives us the answer. You keep the word of his patience. You go and you preach the word of God. You patiently do it. And you serve God and you be fruitful. And if you do that, Jesus Christ promises that he's going to keep you from temptation. He's going to keep you from falling away. It's a wonderful thing when we have scriptures and we can compare those two things, right? Compare scripture with scripture. Anyway, that's just extra. Uh, let's go back to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 16. Luke chapter 8, verse 16. No man, when he have lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed and set it on a candlestick, that they which enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that should not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Now, I don't know what your thoughts are on these, these passages. I used to think this this in particular was about preaching the gospel, about you know the light, shining the light in the, in the, in the community with the light of the gospel. That's what I used to think it meant. But now when I understand it in the context of this chapter, I realize that it's something else. Because remember, what did Jesus Christ start off saying? That, hey, to his disciples, to his believers, they're going to understand the parable. But to those that are potentially reprobate or just aren't ready to receive Jesus Christ right now, they're going to hear, but they're not going to... Uh, understand. They're going to see, see it, but they're not going to, you know, they're not, they're, not, they're not going to understand the parable. All right. So think about this. Look at verse 16. Who are those that saw the light in verse 16? So if you light a candle in your house, for example, who's going to see the light? Look at it, um, the second part of verse 16. But set up it on a candlestick that they which enter may see the light. Who sees the lights in the house? Those that enter the house. Those that are outside the house would not see the light. Think about this in the context of this parable. Who's going to understand the parable? The disciples of Christ. Those that belong to the kingdom of God. Why? Because they've entered in. They've entered into that house and they see the light. They understand the parable. But those that have not entered into Christ, those that have not received Christ as their saviour, they are not going to understand this parable. All right? Verse 17, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. So it's our job for those that, that are blinded to this teaching, that are blinded to the gospel, that are blinded to salvation by grace through faith. It's our job to take that light then and go and make it known. Okay? So you see that two part. Those that understand are those that are saved, that have entered in. And then we need to broadcast that understanding, broadcast that light. Verse 18. Verse 18. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. So it's sort of playing on that same idea there. So whosoever hath are those that are saved. 
Whosoever hath not are those that are unsaved, and especially the reprobate. Okay, they're not going to be able to... It seems like they understand it there, right? The end of it, for him that shall be taken... Sorry, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. So there are people that seem to have the gospel. There are preachers that seem to have the words of God, that seem to understand and seem to teach, but it's taken away from them because they're not in the kingdom of God. They're not even saved. Can you believe that? There are preachers throughout Australia that seem to be saved, seem to be spiritual, seem to be Christian, but they do not have the words of life. They do not have the light of understanding the scriptures. Verse 19. Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not... By the way, his mother did not remain a virgin. Uh, Yes, he was born of a virgin, but she was married to Joseph, and they had children. So here in verse 19, we have the brothers, I guess the half-brothers, if you want to call it that way, and and sisters of Jesus Christ coming to him, as well as his mother. Uh, Sorry, and then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. They couldn't make their way. There was just so many multitudes trying to hear Christ. And he was told, by, uh, told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to see thee. Now, look, I don't believe Jesus Christ was disrespectful to his family at all. Okay, as we read this. He's continuing the teaching that we've had before. Okay? Let's, let's look at this. Verse 21, And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. If you want to be counted close to Christ, where Christ says, hey, this is my mother, these are my brethren, you know, I'm related to them, I'm close to them, we have to be people that not only hear the word of God, but do it. What's the context of what we're just reading about here? Of knowing the gospel, preaching the gospel, being fruitful, doing these things that Christ wants from us. And if we do that, he sees us as his mother and brethren. Okay? More important to him than his blood relatives. Now, they were important. Don't misunderstand. Of course, right? But more important, those that were closest to Jesus are those which kept his commandments. John 14, 15 says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. Those are the words of Christ. If ye love Jesus, keep his commandments. And you know, as we're going through this, the commandment here is to be fruitful, to multiply, to be, to be a, a tree of, of, of righteous, uh, uh, the righteous, the tree of life, preaching the word of God and seeing souls saved. That's who Jesus wants to fellowship with. That's who Jesus wants to be close to. Those that hear and do his commandments. Okay? Verse 22. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water, and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. It's an amazing story here where we see that dual nature of Jesus Christ. You know, that he was definitely a 100% man. You know, he was tired. He was weary. You know, after doing all this work, all this preaching, he just wanted to get into the ship and have a sleep and have a snooze. He needed to recharge his, you know, the the flesh, right? But at the same time, he awakes and he stops the storms and the winds and brings peace. And you see, even nature obeys the words of Jesus Christ. And there we see this reflection of God, the deity of Christ that is God Almighty as well. It's amazing. You see that too, that dual nature right there with him, right? And uh, it's, I feel sorry for the disciples because, you know, I'm not the best swimmer. So if I was in a ship and there was storms and like it was water and like sinking down, I'd be freaking out. I'd be the one going, master, master, you know, we perish. Uh, that, that'd be me. <laughs> and then look, look how Jesus responds in verse 25. And he said unto them, where is your faith? What a rebuke. <laughs> where is your, where, look, don't you know I'm with you in the ship? That's what he's saying. Where's your faith? Haven't you seen me do all these miracles? You know, raise the dead and heal the the blind and the lame and cast out devils and do all these wonderful things. Hey, I'm with you in the ship. Where is your faith? But that's like us. We can be that way. We can go through life 
We're in Christ, Christ is in us, we're saved, and we have the turmoils of life, we have the storms beat down, we have Christ, but we can still panic. We can still, uh, you know, uh, worry and, 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 uh, and, and be bogged down with the cares of this world. And all Jesus would say to you is, where is your faith? That, that's what he wants, because he wants you to rely on him, to know that he's there, that he's near you, and he won't let you go through something that you cannot face. He'll be there to help you through the storms of life. So if that's you today, guys, you're panicking about some situation in life, Jesus says, where is your faith? Okay, Believe on him, trust him, take your cares to him, rely upon him, rely on his strength. Verse 25. Uh, I didn't finish it. And they were uh, afraid, and they being afraid wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and waters, and they obey him. I'm a bit embarrassed by the winds and the waters, because Jesus asked them to do something, and they obey. But us, Jesus asks us to do something, we don't always obey. Right? I mean, even the winds and the waters are more obedient than our sinful flesh, many times, right? That should embarrass us a little bit there. But verse 26, And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. So this country of the Gadarenes, these are not uh, Jews, these are Gentiles now, okay? And you'll probably recognize this because they're, they're like, they've got a farm of, of uh, pigs. And obviously, uh, for the Jews um, and, the, and the commands of Moses, that the, the swine or the pigs were considered an unclean animal, so you wouldn't eat them. But here we have a Gentile nation, and as we go on, we'll see that they are, they, they're farming pigs. Uh, verse 27. And when in... And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and wore no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. You know what this reminds me of? Just like a few weeks ago, was it two or three weeks ago? We had Halloween. Okay, now in Sydney, I think maybe once, one year, I barely ever see anybody doing the trick and treat. Right? The kids going out from house to house, dressing up as devils, dressing up as, as, as ghosts or whatever, and doing trick and treat. Now, maybe part of the reason is because it's Sydney. <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't be comfortable with my kids going out door to door either, you know, alone, you know, collecting candy or whatever, lollies. But here on the Sunshine Coast, when I first arrived back in October last year, I saw it happening. And then again this year, again, a bunch of kids going out, dressed up like devils, doing the trick and treat. So it's definitely something that uh, is going on more in Queensland than it is in New South Wales. And maybe even more on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, maybe people feel more comfortable with their neighbours than in, in the bigger cities, potentially. But one thing that I noticed is you've got these teenage girls. I mean, they're not even really, they're not even dressed. I mean, it's, it's almost like, how whorish can I look? You know, and look like a devil at the same time. Okay, and it's like this man is he's possessed by many devils for a long time and he doesn't wear any clothes. He's completely naked. I mean, that's what, you know, just driving to church, I think, yeah, it was church meeting on, 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 on Halloween day. We're driving down, we see all these kids and, and these teenage girls. It's like, man, are you, are, are you, being, are you trying to be a prostitute? Are you trying to be, uh, look, at, uh, um, you know, as naked as you possibly can? And then it says, neither abode in any house there in verse 27, but in the tombs. Hey, this man that was possessed of devils was preoccupied with death, was preoccupied with the graves, with the tombs. You know, so I, I truly believe that Halloween is a holiday of the devil. Okay? I mean, if you're going to open up your children to Satan and the devils, yeah, Halloween's probably the way to do it. Okay? Because they just reflect what this possessed man is. Okay? Verse 28. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. Hey, the devils know who's in charge. It's not Satan. They know Jesus is in charge and he's begging him, Look, torment me not. Don't cast me into hell. You know, leave me alone, Jesus. You know, what are you doing here? Verse 29. For he that commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes he had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and with fetters, 
and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. So we see somehow that being possessed by devils gives that, gave this man anyway supernatural strength. That he can be chained up, you know, like with handcuffs or chains or whatever, and be able to break free from that. You know, these, these people, this person at least, uh, had supernatural strength. Um, but still, even with the supernatural strength of the devil, they were still afraid of Jesus Christ. Because ultimately, guys, you know, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Okay? We have the Holy Spirit in us. Even if we were to see the devil himself or a man possessed by the devil, it's not something we ought to be necessarily afraid of because we have Christ in us and Christ is in charge of all things. Okay, here's the boss. Verse 30. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils are entered into him. Now, I looked up what legion means. Legion is a military term, a legion of soldiers. And basically, a legion is about 5,000 men. Anywhere between 3,000 to 6,000 men, but roughly 5,000 men. So if, if we were to take this at face value, this man may have very well been possessed by 5,000 devils. I mean, that's, that's pretty crazy. That, that's probably why he had this supernatural strength. He had all this power uh, given to him through the devil. Verse 31. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. All right, so where they didn't want to be tormented, they didn't want to be cast into the deep. So what, what does this talk, what is this about? This is hell, okay? They would not, they, they were still roaming the earth and did not want to be cast into hell, okay? They knew their judgment. They know that God would eventually cast them into hell. They know that's where they're going to end up. But they were begging Jesus, please, not now, right? Don't cast me into that deep. And let me just clarify one thing about hell that's misunderstood by a lot of Christians. Hell is not the kingdom of Satan. Satan and his devils do not rule and reign in hell. They have no power in hell. Okay? Hell is the place of God's righteous judgment and wrath on the unbelievers on those that reject the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says it was prepared first for the devil and his angels. Okay? Don't misunderstand what hell is. Hell is actually a good place. It's a place that God created so that his, the fires of his wrath would bring torment on those that reject and hate God. Okay? And that is the ultimate destination for Satan and his angels and his devils in the lake of fire, in hell. And they're not going to be ruling and reigning and tormenting people. They will be tormented by the wrath of God, by the fires of hell. Okay? Please don't misunderstand that. I've seen that so many places in, in some gospel tracts, you know, re representing hell as Satan's kingdom. It's not. You know, right now, Satan's kingdom is on this earth. Okay? At some point, he's going to be cast. When we know, we know that is, that's after the millennium. But we're going, that's a different topic for another time. Verse 32. And there was an herd of many swine, so these are pigs, feeding on the mountains. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. So Jesus says, all right, you want to go into the pigs? Leave this man alone and go into the pigs. And went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. Uh, when they had fed them, sorry, when they that fed them saw... saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. So, again, this just confirms that it's a Gentile nation. That you've got these people feeding the swine, farming the swine, farming these pigs, was mo most likely used as a food source, just like we use it today. Um, and you might say, well, these poor pigs, these poor swine, that, you know, the devils went into them, this legion of devils, and they ran down the hill into the lake and were, were drowned. The poor swine, you know, the poor animals. We see in Christ how important the soul of a man is. It's more important than an animal. It's more important than a herd of swine. Okay? Jesus would rather those just pigs just, just be drowned, uh, being, being uh, possessed by those devils, and see that to have this man's soul saved, to have him redeemed from the power of the devil. Okay? Again, we're not animals. Okay? We're not, you know, evolved animals. We weren't apes once and became human beings. No. 
God holds man. We're created in the image of God. Okay? We have a soul, spirit, and body. And animals are lower, a lower animal. You know, and so the value of one man's soul, guys, is worth more than whatever the cost was for these men to lose you know, their swine, to lose their animals. Verse 35. Uh, then they went out to see what was done. So the people of the city went to have a look. What's going on? And came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus. So this represents that he was sitting there. He was listening to the teaching of Christ. He had received Christ. Clothed? Hey, put on clothes. All right? Now think about this. You know, if you're somebody, and I, I guess maybe the ladies, you know, I, I'm talking to you, but the men as well. You know, if you're someone that would rather parade, you know, with as little clothes as you can, what does that represent? The devil, the influence of Satan in your life. We have this man who's delivered, now he's fully clothed, standing or sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ. Okay, now I've not taught him clothing, but I will at some point. But be mindful about the clothes you wear. You know, does it reflect Satan and his devils or does it reflect deliverance by Jesus Christ? Clothed. What was I up to? Verse 35. And in his right mind. The guy's not crazy anymore, right? He's not, he's not mad. He's, he's clean. He's sane. He's understanding what is being told of him. And they were afraid. The people of the city were afraid. They should be happy. They should be rejoicing. This man who was a wild man, naked, running around in the tombs, he's delivered. They should be like, wow, this is awesome. You know, look at the power of Jesus Christ. Look what he can do. They're afraid. And what do they do in verse 36? They also which saw it told them by what means he, that he that was possessed of the devils was healed. So they even told him, hey, it was Jesus that healed this man. Then the whole multitude of the country of the gatherings round about besought him to depart from them. For they were taken with great fear. And he went up into the ship and returned back again. So we see this city, the people of the city, they just reject Christ. He does an amazing, miraculous work in their land. These are Gentiles this time, right? We, we can blame the Jews for rejecting Christ, but we, here we have an example of Gentiles afraid of Christ and reject Him. They can't see the good works, you know, and they're more afraid, and they, they tell Him to leave, and He does. Look at, look at verse 38. The man that was possessed of the devils. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought Him that He might be with Him. But Jesus sent Him away, saying... So this man that was possessed and now is, now is good, now believes in Christ... He wants to continue on with Christ. Jesus says, no, you need to stay here. All right? Let's, let's look at this. Saying, verse 39, Return to thine own house and show how great things God have done unto thee. And he went his way and published, that's proclaimed, preached throughout the whole city, how great things Jesus had done unto him. So we have Jesus who's been rejected by the city. He just goes back into Judah, okay? But he leaves the man to be a witness for him. He says, look, the city rejects me, but they know who you are. You know, you go, you stay in your city, and you proclaim the great works that God has done in your life. So Jesus, even though he left, he left them a soul winner. He left them someone that was going to be fruitful, preaching the gospel. He was this possessed man in the past. Okay, if, if it was going to get anyone's attention in the city, it would be him, right? Uh, this man is now preaching Jesus Christ. So, look, Jesus needs to use us. You know, don't get into the mindset, well, you know, I don't have to preach the gospel. You know, Jesus can do it on his own. Hold on. In this case, the people rejected Christ, but he needed a man to stand in there preaching and representing, being an ambassador of the kingdom of God. All right, today we don't have Christ on this earth physically. But we are left here for our community, for our city, to be that witness. That we would proclaim the great works that Christ has done in us. Alright? Verse 40. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him. So he goes to a place now, you know, people are gladly receiving him. That's good. For they uh, were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus. And he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a-dying. But, uh, but as he went, the people thronged him. So Jesus, all right, yep, I'll come to your house, Jairus. I'll come to see your daughter. 
but on his way he gets distracted, right? He gets delayed because of the amount of people that are around him. Verse 43. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood uh, stanched. So it it stopped. And uh, Jesus said, who touched me? Have you ever wondered about this story? This woman, he, she sees Jesus passing along. She can't even reach him because of the amount of people, but he's able to, she's able to reach and touch his garments, just a bit of his clothing, okay? And now she's healed from the issue of blood that she had, okay? Um, and then Jesus says, who touched me? <laughs> <coughs> this woman probably just wants to be hidden, just wants to keep it a secret. I've been healed, thank God you know, and, and, and go about her way sort of thing. Jesus said, who touched me? Right, he, he wants to make this public. When all denied, so she's not saying a word. Everyone else is going, no, nah, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. When all denied, Peter, so these are the disciples, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and pass and press thee and say, thou, who touches me? So he said, look, there are, there are so many people, Jesus, they're all touching you. They're all passing by you. They're all trying to get a hold of you. And you're, you're, one, like, who's, you're asking this question, who touched you? Verse 46, And Jesus said, Somebody have touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. So Jesus had healed somebody. And look, Jesus knows who touched him. Okay, Jesus knows somebody was healed. He knows very well who this individual is. What is he trying to do? He's trying to make this individual speak out. This is not something worth being afraid or hidden about that you were healed by jesus christ all right now verse 47 and when the woman saw that she was not hid so you see she was trying to hide when she realized she was not hid she came trembling and falling down before him she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately and he said unto her daughter be of good comfort Thy faith, your faith, hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Hey, it's her faith on Christ that saved her, that made her whole and healed her from this problem. Guys, look, the lesson here is this. If you've been saved, if you've touched the hem of Jesus' garment, believed on him and you're now you're saved, it's not time for us to hide in the multitude. It's not time for us to be silent about what Jesus has done for us. All right? Jesus is asking you the question, who touched me? Are you going to come before the people and proclaim the great works of Christ? That's what he wants. He doesn't want this woman to just hide and be ashamed and be afraid. No, he wants her to stand up and proclaim how she had put her faith on Jesus Christ. Just like the man that was possessed of the devils is now going out and proclaiming to his city, the great works of Christ. And so you might say, I'm shy, I'm timid. Who touched him? Who touched Jesus? You need to speak out. You know, when you get an opportunity to preach the gospel, you need to take it. Take it with both hands. Be of com- good comfort, Jesus says. You know, don't be afraid. Verse uh, 49? Yeah, 49. <coughs> While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue, so he's, you know, he's making his way to Jairus' house. And there comes someone from, from the uh, synagogue's house um, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. So Jesus, because he was delayed, because he was, you know, there's so many people around him, he doesn't make it in time to heal this, this girl, this 12-year-old girl, and she dies. But when Jesus heard it, saying, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. Notice that about Jesus. You know, he's not so, he's not prideful at all. You know, he comes with all humility. It says there in verse 52, and all wept. That includes his disciples that came with him. That includes Jesus Christ. Jesus came in a situation and recognized this little girl had died. And he saw the mourning, the the sadness, the sorrow of the family. And before Jesus even heals the girl, he weeps. 
you know, he's touched by the emotion. You know, he, he feels what they feel. He's not like, hey, just get over it. I'll raise it from the dead. No, he, he sorrows with them. Okay, he cares about their feelings. He cares about uh, their sorrows. <clears throat> um, sorry. And all wept, 52, and bewailed her. And he said, weep not. She is not dead, but sleepeth. <laughs> she's, she's not dead, she's just sleeping. Now think about this. I'll just read to you from 1 Thessalonians 4.14, which is about the rapture, the resurrection of the saints. It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. You know, the Bible talks about death many times as sleep. It's not soul sleep. The soul goes to be with the Lord if you're saved, but the body is sleeping. If you're saved or if you have loved ones that are saved and they've died physically they're not really dead in the eyes of jesus christ in the eyes of god they're just asleep they're just asleep and they're coming back okay when christ returns gives them those new resurrected bodies without sin they're going to be awakened in their bodies and be with the lord forever and so the fact that he says that this girl is asleep to me anyway i'll get your opinions later on is that she too was a believer in Christ, for Christ to be able to say that she sleeps. Does that make sense? Anyway, let's move on. <clears throat> Verse 53, And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again. So she was definitely dead. Her spirit had left the body. But verse 55, And her spirit came again. And she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And I love that about Christ. When he heals somebody or he raises them from the dead, it's not like, all right, you know, just take it easy. Have your rest. You know, you, you've just come back from the dead. No, it's like, you know what? You're, you're healed now. You've been raised from the dead. Can you go and serve me some food? I'm hungry. <laughs> all right? Because it's, it's a full recovery. You know, she's got all her energy back. You know, she, she's back on her feet. She's probably better than she's ever been, right? She's had a good sleep, and Christ has woken her up, brought her back from the dead, and commands her to, to give her meat. And let me just say this. I, I look, she was 12 years old. She was 12 years old. And, um, you know, parents, we can't baby our children forever. At 12 years old, she was old enough to cook. She was old enough to serve. You know, if you've got children that are at least 12 or over, and they're not doing anything around the house, then you're failing as a parent. Okay, for Jesus, hey, you're 12, you should be old enough to cook. You should be old enough to minister and serve. And let me just, you know, this is just another point, but let me just say, guys, you know, um, parents, if you've got children and they're, and they're of a certain age, you should instruct them, teach them, you know, direct them to serve the house. You know, so if Jesus Christ comes one day, that your 12-year-old daughter is ready to be able to cook and, and bring him a meal. All right? Anyway, side note. Verse 56. And her parents were astonished. But he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. And again, we understand this. Hey, he wants people to proclaim his name. We saw this in this chapter. We know that it was his heart to go from city to city, from village to village. He even goes and spends time with a Gentile uh, people. All right, and he was that man that was possessed of the devil. All right, but understand that Jesus was someone that wanted to work orderly. He wanted order and not, you know, make all this fame known about him to be then, uh, you know, uh, um, have so many people follow after him where it would prevent his ministry from being successful. So we'll leave it there, guys. I hope you take this into consideration, especially, especially how important it is for us not to uh, give in to that hour of temptation. What's the promise that God gives us? That if we would preach his word, that we would keep his word, that we would be fruitful and preach the gospel, that he would do that for us. He would keep us from temptation and we would not be believers that would fall away. You know, if, you, if you've got some concern, I don't know, I might not, you know, I might, not, I might not live for Christ all my life. Then start with the basics. You know the gospel. You know how you got saved. You know it's by grace through faith on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Take that to your neighbor. Take that to your friends. And God says, hey, he will increase your faith. God will strengthen you so that you would not be able to give in to that temptation and fall away from the faith. All right, let's pray.